very nice to, to, to see you all here. Lots, some faces I know, some I don't. Uh, just a little bit, uh, a little bit more of, um, of my background, just sort of really, I'm just trying to justify why I'm standing here in front of you talking about real estate, because ironically, I'm quite a newbie to the real estate industry. I've only been involved in it for about 16 years, and I suspect there's a few people here who've been in it uh, uh, a fair bit longer. Uh, the BPF, I, I did a lot of work on lobbying, lobbying government. And of course, I got very immersed then in what the property industry can do, what it does do, and the particular area of regeneration, which in itself is an interesting word. You know, what do we actually mean by regeneration? When does development become regeneration? Is all regeneration just a form of development? And, and I know pretty much all of you in this room today are involved in some form or another of development. So I suppose you could say I actually spent quite a bit of time doing the theory of regeneration and development within the BPF. And then when I retired, uh, and, and a year or so later, having first of all um, done a little bit of work with Birmingham around Curzon Street, where the HS2 station was going to go, looking at the potential for regeneration there. And I was a Brummy, by the way, so, so that meant something to me. I was quite interested in Curzon, or Digbeth, as we used to call it, uh, not fancy, fancy new, new names. Uh, then the Mayor of London asked me to, to chair the Old Oak and Park Royal Development Corporation, site of another HS2 station, so there's definitely an HS2 thread in that. So, oh my God, suddenly all that theory I'd been sort of waffling on about for the last um, uh, 10 years, I had to start and put into practice. So that's been quite uh, an education, and I'll talk a little bit about OPDC in, in a moment. It's not an easy regeneration project, but then on the whole, regeneration projects aren't. That's why, you know, they're what they, they're what they are. So, so what I'm going to talk about today is it's, it's really about how development and regeneration now actually sort of sits in the in the public psyche in the government psyche you know where do we think we've got to where are in some cases we going wrong why are we getting the opposition we get because I'm sure a number of you would agree it's not easy trying to do development why is it not easy when actually from our perspective we all think it's delivering good but maybe other people don't have quite that perception of what we do so just to start off, to sort of start from a very sort of basic level, just think a bit about the nature of property and what we do. Property is a factor of production. It's difficult to do most things in a civilised society unless you've got somewhere to do it. You know, so you can't make things, you can't buy things, you can't live unless you've got some, some fabric around you. So, so property satisfies a social need. It's about housing, it's education, it's health, it's leisure, it's work. That's sort of quite straightforward. But, you know, we and, and the industry of whole, of course, have made something much more complex and sophisticated out of property because it's also an investment class. So there's a whole group of people who are looking at property and how you get a return on the investment in the property. So one man's social needs are another person's investment income. Now, you know, that makes for quite an interesting juxtaposition. Who, who tops the other? You know, which one is dependent on, on the other. When we're talking about the urban realm, we are talking primarily about property. And I don't think many people would doubt that there's an awful lot of the urban realm that does actually need renewal. And who's best place to do it? Well, of course, the property industry, because we know how to build things. We know how to design things. We then mostly know how to manage them, although don't get me on the subject of property management, because I think that's, a, that's probably a, worth another, almost a lunchtime, uh, a lunchtime in itself. So the property industry are definitely the people who can come in and do the rebuilding that society, that society needs. But of course, it isn't quite that straightforward. You know, we're not always welcomed with open arms. So why aren't we? Um, and of course, we, we, when we're doing that, we have to be able to make a profit because if as a business you don't make a profit, you don't last very long. So, so again, you, know, you see this sort of juxtaposition of people see you as delivering uh, the answer to a social need. We are delivering the answer to that social need, but in a way that has to be profitable. Are those, are those two things entirely compatible? So why is sort of regeneration of the urban realm then so complicated? Well, of course, the first problem is, you, and as I've discovered in spades at Old Oak, uh, you cannot actually um, build something without the appropriate infrastructure around it. It is no good building homes if you can't actually get to them, if there aren't schools, if there aren't shops. 
same with commercial development. If you're building a commercial, something for commercial letting, the people have actually got to be able to get to it. And they've got to be able to get to it in a way that doesn't cause even more of a traffic problem than you, than you might have already. Uh, infrastructure, something this country, and yeah, back in our sort of Victorian era, we were frightfully good at. Um, we didn't really sort of get into the sort of renewal we needed to do in the 20th century. So we have a backlog. We have a deficit of, of infrastructure need. Um, if you look at something like Crossrail 2, you know, it's a no brainer in terms of London needing it. 26 billion quid's quite a big price tag. You know, and the Treasury are sort of sucking their teeth over that. But you know, I'm sure all of you, like me, travel around London, you use the tube, you know how congested this city is. Even the first Crossrail, when we finally get it, is not going to solve the problem. You know, we're actually solving the problem of 10 years ago with Crossrail 1. We now need to be thinking about Crossrail 2. Who pays for that? The whole housing and affordability agenda uh, you know, is massively important. We can build houses, no problem. All of you people in this room can build houses. But are they the houses people can afford to buy? And if people can't afford to buy them, how do you actually ensure that you can build houses, but they can be passed on to the people who actually need to live in them? Interesting conundrum there. The stakeholder environment. Now, I mean, this is so complex. And again, the, the, those of you who are involved in sort of frontline development, I imagine you grapple with this, uh, with this every day. There are now so many different stakeholders. It's not just about the local authority from whom you need your planning permission. It's not just about your bank who might actually give you some finance for it. You know, this is about everybody in the community. Uh, it is about um, subgroups of groups. You know, you only need sort of a pressure group of one who can get a website. And I'm oh, sorry, that's probably old-fashioned now. What do they have? A WhatsApp or an Instagram? Well, yeah, sorry, I don't keep up with all that. I'm sort of, but anyway, you know what I mean. You, you need a pressure group of one with its social media. You know, and suddenly you're completely screwed. Yeah, and it can take you an awful long time to get around that. So stakeholder environment massively complex. And I think this is where sort of the shift over the last five or six years, which really worries me in London, the sort of politics and perception of property. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm sure some of you will have followed with great interest um, Grosvenor's uh, attempts to do a development in Bermondsey. Grosvenor, you know, blue chip type of company that everybody thinks does things properly. You know, still can't actually get a planning permission because they can't, won't, can't, interesting point, build the right amount of affordable housing to keep the local authority on side. Think of the Haringey business with Lendlease. Actually, uh, everybody, well, I, I used to know the leader of Haringey quite well, and she said the people on those estates that Lendlease were going to rebuild were almost begging them to get started. But it still didn't happen, did it? Because of the, the quite perverse politics in Haringey. If you have a chat to uh, Capco about uh, Earl's Court, you know, they'll also tell you some of the difficulties. Um, they have found a particularly intransigent local authority. But did they get off on the wrong foot in terms of just how they were trying to position what they were trying to do? So the politics and perceptions of our industry, I think, are, are really, really difficult. And I think it's worth just making, making the point here. I was going to make it at the end, but I'll, I'll say it now because I've sort of been developing this in my mind for the last sort of couple of weeks that I think as an industry, we have changed a huge amount over the last 15, 16 years. I'd like to think I played a little part in that at the BPF, in, in repositioning our industry as a valuable part of society, caring about society, meeting society's needs. The trouble is we've changed, but actually society's carried on changing even faster. And so we have now this society, you know, driven by social media, driven by the idea that if somebody has a want or a need, it must be satisfied and somebody must listen to them. So society has gone whooshing off even further uh, d down the line. You know, and we as an industry, even though we have changed, are now going to have to start changing again or speed up our own pace, our own pace of change in order to keep up with those sort of perceptions of what people think our industry is and does. Local authorities, um, I've mentioned, I've mentioned them. Um, they, they are very variable. Again, I'm sure some of you have good experiences with local authorities. 
looking at from the local authority perspective, they're very much listening to their communities. They are also strapped for cash. They probably don't have the expertise or the right people to have the sort of debate with you that you would like them to have. Uh, I mean, I, I always felt from the perspective of the development industry, you know, we, we'd like local authorities to have to good, tough negotiators. We like an equal negotiation. You know, if you're dealing with somebody who doesn't know or doesn't understand or doesn't know, know what they can give away or how far they can go, it's actually more difficult to have a good negotiation because their defence is then to say no if they don't understand. So if you've not got people who are as good at negotiating and developing and structuring deals as you are, you will always have a hard time. And of course, local authorities just don't have the resource to, to provide that. And then of course, our, our wonderful uh, government back in 2010 decided neighborhood uh, forums, not just district councils and borough councils to deal with, but you should now actually go down to the neighborhood level just to make things even more complicated course the districts and the boroughs didn't like that at all because they saw that as taking power away from them from our perspective it you know puts yet another layer yet another layer in and i've mentioned you know what social media uh, means in the in, in in that context how it empowers people to have a voice to interfere you know to make your life basically far more difficult than when you used to have to get together a town hall meeting in, in order to in order to get to opinions. I mean, one of the, just epitomising all I've been saying about urban regeneration being difficult, land assembly is always a challenge, but Old Oak has the infrastructure problem in spades. You know, we've calculated we probably need to spend in the order of a billion quid ju just to facilitate development. That's before you actually start building any homes building any of the, the sort of real buildings that people can do things in you know we need we need bridges we need roads we need energy centers and then all the soft social infrastructure that goes with it but particularly to start off with the sort of roads and bridges to get in and out of the site I said to our technical director you know, he was giving showing me some costs I said, god you know how much does it cost to build a bridge can't you just put a few girders across the Grand Union Canal but no no it's got to be a beautiful bridge of course to satisfy design criteria and the canals and rivers trust and everything else so so infrastructure is going to be massive. Cost of land assembly will be challenging because of Mr. Warren and others. Uh, the mayor has now decided that any site has to have a minimum of 35% affordable housing. Uh, if it's public land, 50% uh, affordable housing. Large swathes of Old Oak Common are public land and network rail land. Uh, so we will be looking at how to try and get 50% affordable housing. And we can talk about affordable housing later if you want to, because you, know, you split that up into the different categories of affordable. 30% of that has to be social, 30% has to be intermediate, 30% probably shared ownership or some other form of tenure. The local authorities think at least 60% of that 35% um, should be social housing. That's a 40% of market rent. It's not doable. You know, from a viability perspective, you can't, you can't actually do that. I've got three um, local authorities. That's why we're a mayoral development corporation, to try and bring them together. We do have quite a lot of other local pressure groups. We're, we have included within our patch Wormwood Scrubs. I don't mean the prison. Mm. I mean the, the common land. And, and again, this was a revelation. I always thought Wormwood Scrubs was a prison. I didn't realise that it's actually a, an area of public space roughly the size of Hyde Park. Uh, protected by Act of Parliament for the benefit of all Londoners. And I haven't even mentioned the Park Royal side of it, which is another fascinating set of challenges, how you manage a business park like Park Royal that's grown up by accretion and evolution, full of lots of sort of single-storey tin sheds, that some of which are probably, well, no, I'm sure they don't meet modern health and safety standards. How do you get the sort of redevelopment and intensification? Here are my, my solutions for how to make regeneration easier. Um, first of all, I think we absolutely have to put people at the heart of what we do. We are, we are the property industry. We build buildings, but buildings are only of any use because people use them. And if they're not what people want and support, then we're kidding ourselves. And we're wasting our time. So actually, maybe as an industry, we haven't always thought quite deeply enough about what the people who will be in our buildings really want and need. And, and I think we've got to find a way of making consultation really meaningful. We've got to listen. Um, we, we've then got to, out of that, create a, a doable scheme, a viable scheme, because if it's not viable or doable, we're not going to survive very long. But you've got to start from the perspective of what do, what do the people actually want. 
brings me on to my second point, and this is coming back to the affordable housing one. How do we as an industry actually help government solve this conundrum of providing the houses that people want? The, the volume house builders build a certain number of houses at a price they know they can sell them at in order to yield uh, the sort of returns they get. Uh, my God, they've been pretty stellar returns for the last few years. There's only one or two that haven't done it, and one because it was a basket case anyway, nothing to do with the, uh, you know, the fundamentals of the, of the industry. Of course, the perception out there is that actually a lot of that success of the house builders has been funded through help to buy anyway. So that doesn't sort of put them on quite the right sort of plane for, for, for this sort of debate. But the fact remains that the real housing need, and I say need, not demand, mm -hmm. is in people from people who cannot afford to pay even the sort of more modest prices at the lower end of the scale of what the volume house builders are producing. So the conundrum for society is finding the sort of housing that I suppose what George Peabody would have called London's working poor, people who've got jobs, but they, you know, they're earning 15, 20, 25,000 a year. We need them. They're serving you at lunch. You know, they're running the hospitals. They're, they're doing all, they're collecting the rubbish. They're doing all the things we need. They cannot afford to live in what we can build. How are we going to solve that problem? Now, you know, there's a couple of things you could do. Uh, we could either have a mandated affordable housing provision You'll all squeal with horror and say, yes, but what about, you know, we've paid prices for land or for sites. How do we deal with that? Well, ultimately, that would work its way through the system back into land, land price. Uh, and maybe we just have to grit our teeth and accept that that is going to come. Or the government has to find a way of funding a council, build, a council house building programme, the sort of thing that was done between and after the and after the wars. And that's going to mean taxation. And you can bet your bottom dollar will be one of the industries they look at for the taxation. So I'd be very interested to get views from you on that, but I don't think we can avoid this. I think it's an elephant in the room. I think we as the development industry have got to find a way of helping the government to build more affordable housing. Third point, um, we need to focus on the quality of what we do. Uh, I'm sure all of you involved in development build beautiful things. Uh, quite a few people out there don't. You know, there's quite a lot of stuff we have done, uh, well, over the last 50 years. But even more recently, I mean, the persimmon story, was it at the beginning of this, this week, about what had been built that didn't meet fi uh, modern fire safety standards? You know, we can't, as an industry, expect people to trust us if we can't be trusted to actually deliver good quality. And it's not just about meeting building regs, it's also about making it good in design terms. Now, I'm not one of these people who thinks it has to be sort of sterling prize architecture, because actually I was always rather of the view, if you want to live in a house, you know, you're a, you're a normal couple with kids, uh, you want somewhere safe for the kids to play, you know, you want a good secure roof over your head. It doesn't have to be, as I say, sterling design quality, but it should be good quality. It should be solid. It should give people what they need. It should give them storage space. I mean, I've been in some modern houses. Goodness knows how they'd expect a family to live there. Maybe I just have more than the normal amount of clutter, but I bet you all do as well. You know, hey, you've got to build something that people actually want, actually want to live in. And if the industry is saying, well, you know, none of this is affordable, we can't build this higher quality, well, we've got some serious thinking to do because we shouldn't be building if we can't build a good quality. My fourth point, uh, we've got to look at innovative ways of, of funding all the ancillary things that go with development. Section 106 has been a fudge for years. You may recall some, some dreadful woman was asked to do a review of community infrastructure levy a few years ago, and we <coughs> came up with some interesting ideas which the government chose not to adopt. Still doesn't work. That was certainly one of our conclusions. Uh, and we have got to um, help the government, be willing to help the government with alternative ways at looking for some element of value capture. Now, if we're not careful, we'll end up with sort of, well, I don't think government would go down the development land tax again because it never did work in the past, but, but there must be some sensible way of actually capturing a fair amount of value. And I think we should tell government what we think that fair amount of value should be and not wait for them 
them to tell us. Funnily enough, I, I wrote a piece recently for, for Property Week and it was actually around something I'd done with the district council's network and Stuart Lipton drops me an email afterwards. I get these sort of lordly emails whenever I, I do anything. I said, the answer's taxation, Liz. Oh, blimey, OK, right. Well, you know, I'll try that one out on, <laughs> on my audience and see what they think. Uh, I mean, it, it, it is interesting. You could argue that the simple, fairer way of doing it would be some form of taxation, you know, a, a permit to develop for which everybody pays a certain percentage of what, though? Of your sale price, of your... That's fine if it's for sale. What's it, what about if it's rent? Then it gets very complicated. But again, I think it's the industry that's got to think of the way of doing this and suggest to the government, because if they come up with something, it'll be crap, I can assure you. It will not work. <laughs> I've seen how they, how they do this sort of thing. And, and lastly, you know, we, we do have to find ways of, of, sort of creative and innovative ways of bridging the gap between the public and private sector. Sometimes it works, sometimes there are good relationships, but it goes back to what I was saying earlier about quite often public authorities or local authorities in particular just don't have the resource to have the sort of people who can work with us. You know, and who are of the quality and the toughness to be able to face up to you guys when you're going in there and negotiating. We've got to find ways of helping them, helping them do that, helping them, you know, even if it means funding people, you know, no commitment, no, no guarantees of outcome, but helping them um, get, the right, get the right sort of people to, to work with us. Uh, genuine joint ventures, you know, and, and they can work in some places. I know they are exceedingly difficult. You know, it's like pushing water uphill sometimes because of the sorts of people you're dealing with. But we, we've got to persuade the Haringeys and the Hammersmiths and Fulhams of this world, you know, that we, we are genuinely there to help them. Now, I said I was going to mention why I haven't actually talked about planning. I, I, it, it, discussions around this invariably go back to planning. Bloody awful planning system, what are we going to do to change it? M my perspective now, having spent 16 years trying to change the planning system, is you aren't going to change it. And, and that actually we have to come at this slightly more obliquely. And that if we focused on all those five things I'd been talking about, then do you know, I actually think the planning system would be a lot easier to navigate. Because I think those things would actually help build the trust where planning then became less of a confrontational them and us, less of a sort of uh, two-sided argument with, with two, sets, two sets of opponents, and it would be genuinely more of a cooperative way of doing things. So my final point is, you know, in, in terms of what I've outlined, um, might this in the short term actually cost us? Might this actually reduce the amount of profit we can make for, for development? Well, yes, maybe it will, but then maybe that's preparing the ground for the longer term. And the one thing I'd all remind you is property is a longer term play and that we all complain about governments being short term, you know, that you can't plan in a five year electoral cycle, be it local or central government. You know, our buildings are going to be there for 30 to 50 years. So we do have to think long term about how we actually make the regeneration of the urban realm easier than we're currently finding it today. Thank you very much. <laughs>